Hello, my third grade summer friends. I am here to read a bit more of Rumpf. Uh, if you remember, in the last chapter I read you, Rumpf found out from a gnome who had a message from Red that the miller was looking for him. So he started to feel worried. He knows that he's not safe. So this is chapter 26, which is called Destiny Calls. I was not safe, and neither was anyone who cared about me. I tried to brush off the feeling, especially when I sat with my aunts in the warmth of their home, eating their good food and watching their magical spinning and knitting and weaving, but it was no use. The more I tried to tell myself not to worry, the more I worried, and I knew that I had to leave. I left my aunts on a frigid morning without so much as a goodbye. I couldn't risk them knowing where I was going, and I didn't think I could bear the looks on their faces, especially Ida. I would miss her the most. I would miss our rhymes. I made up a farewell rhyme as I walked away. Home is a place with three dear aunts. They cook good food and sew nice pants. They spin and knit and weave and mend. Goodbye for now, three dear friends. I walked through the forest while it was still dark. My satchel weighed down on my shoulder, heavy with the food I had stolen from my aunts. My stomach was heavy with guilt. The frozen snow crunched beneath my feet. I had decided I would go to the mountains beyond beyond. It was the farthest place from the kingdom I knew of. I could live all alone in a mountain cave far away from anyone and herd goats and live off their milk and whatever the land would give me. I had considered going back to the trolls, thinking they might be able to protect me from my own magic. But I wasn't too fond of the idea of eating sludge for the rest of my life. My stomach wiggled at the thought of it. Besides, they were so close to the kingdom, and I know they got news of weddings and babies. The risk was too great. I emerged from the trees and was on the road before dawn. The air was bitter cold and I wrapped myself tighter inside the thick coat my aunts had made me. Soon I'd left the village behind. Before long I heard muffled voices in the distance. It was still dark but I could just make out the shadowy movements of something farther up the road. I veered off into the trees. It might just be a farmer bringing wool to the village or a peddler coming to trade his trinkets and treasures, but I didn't want anyone to see me. As they drew closer, their voices became clear. I don't think this is right, said a boy's voice. It was irritatingly familiar. The woman said he came this way, said another voice also familiar. But she didn't see the gnome. We were supposed to be following the gnome. If you hadn't lost it, it's impossible to keep up with a gnome, you idiot. And anyway, it doesn't matter. We're on his trail. When I find that butt, I'm gonna punch him so hard he sees pixies. You punch like a girl, Frederick. Quiet! If we don't find him, father's going to make us go back to the mountain and work in the mines. Do you want that? No! A chill ran down my spine that had nothing to do with the cold. My heart began to thump in my chest. Frederick and Bruno were standing just feet away from me. I shifted nervously and a dead twig snapped beneath my boot. Shh! Do you hear that? Probably a rabbit. I held very still. Frederick moved in my direction. If he came any closer, I would need to run. I stepped back, bracing myself. <sighs> this is where I would like to really complain about the Witch of the Woods advice. You see, if you're going to give someone advice, it's important to be specific. Watch your step is not specific at all. You take 
lots of steps every day. So it really helped to know which step to be careful on. Watch your step when you're around poop or a trap. Watch your step when you're near a tower window or a pixie nest. I stepped on a pixie nest. I think my Aunt Hadel's advice was also lacking. Waking one pixie from its sleep is foolish. Waking a nest full of pixies is a death wish. A piercing shriek exploded from the ground and filled the air so it must have reached every ear within a mile. Pixies shot out and pelted towards me like a thousand tiny arrows. Pink and blue and red and orange sparks, their teeth bared for war. I screamed like a mountain lion and fell to the ground and rolled, throwing mud and dirt all over. But those pixies bit my nose, my cheeks, my ears, all ten of my fingers. They bit clear through my clothes onto my arms and legs. They wet up my pants and bit me right on my namesake, which is my rump. Finally, the pixies flew away through the trees, either satisfied that they had punished me enough and tired of the dirt. I could feel all of my body parts beginning to swell. My bottom expanded beneath me. My legs felt like fat logs floating on water, just bobbing around without any control. My face puffed up, making my skin stretch and tighten. Although my eyes were swollen nearly shut, I could see enough to know that Frederick and Bruno were standing over me. They wore soldiers' uniforms and both pointed big hunting knives right at my face. Hello, butt, said Frederick. Fancy a stroll? No, thank you. I'm rather busy, is what I meant to say. But that's not what came out through my swollen lips. It was more like, no, thank you. I said I'd be there. And drool ran down my face. Frederick laughed. I didn't think you could get any uglier. Tie him up. Bruno knelt down and grabbed my puffy hands to tie them together. He had a tough time of it though. My hands were so fat, it was almost impossible to get my wrists together. Finally, he tied me at my elbows, which was probably the only place the pixies didn't bite. We've missed you so much, but, said Frederick as he patted my swollen face, I winced. Bruno laughed. Father misses you too, and so does our sister, the queen. I was afraid they were going to tell me she'd had the baby, but they didn't. <sighs> I breathed. As long as she didn't have the baby, or I didn't hear of it, there was a way out of this. Of course the miller wanted me to spin gold for him, but I didn't have to. I wouldn't, not for anything. They dragged me out of the trees, then marched me down the road in the direction I had already been traveling, but definitely not where I wanted to go. I knew this was a very serious problem. Frederick and Bruno were kidnapping me at knife point. I should have been terrified, but I couldn't think of any of that because I was seething mad at the swarm of pixies and at Red's granny for her vague advice. I had sausage fingers I could barely see. I was drooling out of my fat lips and my butt was lopsided. It is very awkward to walk with a lopsided bottom. As I waddled down the road, my heart swelled too, but with sadness. I could say that none of it mattered, that I should just give up and let the tangles keep wrapping until they covered the top of my head and pushed me down into the earth. 
What did it matter that Frederick and Bruno had captured me? What did it matter that they were taking me to the miller who wanted me to spin him gold forever? But in my heart, it mattered. I didn't want to be trapped. I wanted to grow and I wanted to break free. When the sun set, we stopped to camp and I was tied to a tree near the road. I was actually grateful to sit on snow and ice. It soothed my sore, sorry rump, but I was also starving. And I watched hungrily as Frederick and Bruno tore through my satchel and ate all the food I had packed. They threw me a chunk of bread, which I had to bend down and eat in the dirt like a dog. Frederick commanded Bruno to guard me. When they were together, Bruno did whatever his brother told him. But by himself, he was meaner than Frederick. Maybe he was only mean to me because other people had made him feel small. And he wanted to prove that he was big. Suddenly, I felt sorry for Bruno in a way that I never had. And Frederick, too, because he probably felt small around the miller. And the miller probably felt small around someone else, like King Barf. But I didn't feel too sorry. Bruno might feel smaller than me even, but I didn't think meanness was ever in anyone's destiny. Meanness is a choice. At first, we only sat in silence, but then Bruno grew bored. He laughed and poked at my swollen face. They made a good breakfast of you, didn't they? He laughed and laughed until he fell in the snow and sputtered at the cold shock. As darkness fell, it grew very cold. I sat shivering against the tree while Frederick wrapped himself in a thick woolen blanket. Bruno tried to do the same, but Frederick yanked his blanket away. Keep watching butt, he commanded. He's tied up tight enough, Bruno whined. I said, watch him. Bruno faced me and glowered, but as soon as Frederick was asleep, he wrapped himself in his blanket and curled up by the fire. Good night, but, Bruno whispered loudly and then joined his brother in snoring slumber. I waited and shivered. Everything was quiet. The fire was dead and there was only a sliver of moonlight to see by. It was impossible to sleep because I was so cold and swollen with pixie bites. So I stayed awake thinking about my destiny. And when I got tired of that, I cursed pixies and gnomes, but mostly pixies. But then a miracle happened. During the night, my swelling started to go down, helped by the cold air, I guess. And as it went down, my bindings loosened. I wriggled, but it wasn't quite enough to get me free yet. I deflated a little more every hour, and I wiggled and wiggled as Frederick and Bruno <sighs> snored on. Just as the sky was fading from black to purple, my hands and arms were almost back to normal and they slipped out of the ropes. I praised the pixies. I wished they had bitten me a hundred more times and made me as fat as the miller. Beautiful, lovely pixies. It's funny how some things you think are terrible can turn out to be really wonderful. I loved my swollen arms and fingers and my lopsided butt. Something rustled in the bushes, probably just a squirrel or rabbit, but it made Bruno stop snoring. He smacked his lips and pulled his covers tighter around him. I moved as fast and as quietly as I could. With my arms free, I was able to wriggle myself out of the rest of my ropes. Just as I pulled the last rope over my head, the rustling noise came again, and from the shrubs appeared a gnome. He was hopping with great excitement. 
Greetings from the kingdom! King Barfy Few, Archie Baldy Reginaldi Fife, and Queen Opal both happily announce the birth of their new son, heir to the throne of the kingdom. His name is. I clamped my hand over the gnome's mouth, but it was too late. I had heard exactly what I didn't want to hear, and Frederick and Bruno were awake now, staring bleary-eyed between the gnome and me. I dropped the gnome, scrambled to my feet, and ran, except I ran in exactly the opposite direction from where I wished to go. I had freed myself from Frederick and Bruno's ropes, but the ropes that had tangled and knotted inside of me were now tugging at me, pulling me like a stubborn donkey in the direction of the kingdom. It was time to collect on my worst bargain ever. Uh-oh, the queen had the baby. That means Rump has to go back. Ah, whatever will come next, we'll find out soon enough. All right, bye. Have a wonderful summer. See you soon.